Welcome everybody to Your Freedom Unlimited with me, your host, Jen Ramsey. I'm so excited this week to be presenting and, and uh, presenting to you our guest for the week, which is Dr. Bernardo Castrop from the Netherlands. Um, welcome to, to, to your time with us, Bernardo. Thank you for Thanks. spending some time with us today. Really Thanks appreciate for it. Me. Oh, it's I'm very honored to have you here. So um, Dr. Kastrup is going to be sharing with us his views on the primacy of consciousness. Um, so Bernardo's work has really been leading the modern renaissance of metaphysical idealism. So this is the notion that reality is essentially mental. And uh, he has two PhDs, a PhD in philosophy or ontology or the philosophy of the mind, and a second PhD in computer engineering, in reconfigurable computing and artificial intelligence. So as a scientist, Bernardo has worked for CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, and also the Philips Research Laboratories where the Casimir effect of quantum field theory was discovered. So Bernardo's ideas have been presented in many academic papers and books, and have also been featured in a range of more mainstream publications in terms of Scientific American, the Institute of Art and Ideas, the blog of the American Philosophical Association and Big Think. Among other things, Bernardo's most recent book is The Idea of the World, a multidisciplinary argument for the mental nature of reality. So I'm really um, very honored to have you with us here today, Bernardo, and really appreciate your time to help uh, unveil and to explain some of these concepts to us and really where, I think this to me is where we've got the intersect of um, philosophy and scientific thought meeting um, spiritual thought around consciousness, but I think let's not move into the spiritual just yet. I'd just love to hear your views and hear your your thinking around this notion of the primacy of consciousness. And if you could, I guess, just step that out for us in a, in, a, in simple terms and, and just take us on, on a journey with that. Yes, uh, the idea is that um, uh, the nature of the world itself is mental. Uh, it is uh, from within, uh, from a first person perspective, um, it is conscious, so to say. Now, this does not mean that uh, the world is in your personal mind or my personal mind alone. There obviously is an objective natural world out there that behaves according to predictable natural laws insofar as we are able to, to verify. Um, but the, the point here is that although the world is outside our personal minds, it's not outside mind as a category. So uh, the postulate is that the objective world is constituted by transpersonal mental states or experiential states. So we've got this, we've, we've got individuals, but inside individual mental states inside this bigger mental state. Yes, we each have, of course, our private individual minds or our mm -hmm. private individual consciousnesses. I use the terms uh, interchangeably, and, and my, I mean by that, that we have individual experience. Mm -hmm. um, but we are obviously immersed in a context, in a world that exists, whether we are looking at it or not, and would still exist if we were not here. Uh, that is undeniable, and uh, I don't deny that. I don't think any serious idealist would deny that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the postulate is, sim is simply that we are immersed in a world of transpersonal experiential states, which presents itself to us in the form of what we call the physical world. So the physical world is an appearance of uh, transpersonal mental states. That That's the postulate. Right, okay. So <clears throat> I guess the question then, and I've heard you explain this uh, the analogy you've given is almost like our individual mental states or our minds are almost like a whirlpool inside the bigger in the, inside the bigger body the bigger mass of water is that is that fair yes to say? yes look it, if my postulate is correct and i think we have mm. plenty of reasons to believe it is then it's all mind right mm. um but there obviously are boundaries, at least seeming boundaries within this uh, mental context, because I can't read your thoughts, presumably you can't read mine, at least under ordinary circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what's going on in the galaxy of Andromeda. Uh, so mm -hmm. if we are all in one big mind, uh, we have to account for, for these barriers that prevent us from reaching out beyond our personal selves. Right. So uh, um, and I, I think what we, we 
we can appeal to uh, uh, is to a well-known psychiatric phenomenon, phenomenon called dissociation. But that's more difficult to explain outside an academic context. So I use the metaphor of a whirlpool. You can imagine universal mind or universal consciousness as a body of water. Um, and within that body of water, you have a sort of localization process of certain mental content, which leads to the appearance that uh, there are individual minds and a way to visualize that, not very rigor rigorously, but it's very evocative, is to think of little whirlpools or eddies uh, forming in water wow. uh, because you can, you can clearly identify them. You can say there is a whirlpool can trace the boundary of the whirlpool very precisely in the same way that uh, we can trace the boundaries of our bodies and mm -hmm. we can say there is a body and yet there is nothing to a whirlpool but the water uh, of that body of water and you mm -hmm. can you cannot lift the whirlpool out of the water because it is water there is nothing mm -hmm. to it but the water in the same way i would say that there is nothing to us or to any living being other than mind but we are just the images, the appearances of a process of localization within mind that you can visualize as a whirlpool. But we are just mental beings as the rest of the world as well. As part of the bigger whole. And <clears throat> so this raises some big questions, I guess, for me. Um, two of them, but we'll, we'll obviously take one at a time. The first thing is, is well, what is the implication for us as human beings for this? What, when, what? So that's my first question. And the second question is, is how did you come to this 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 way of thinking? Your background was in computer science. You moved into this space of philosophy. But um, let's perhaps just, they're the two big questions on my mind at the moment, but let's just take perhaps the, the first one. What are the implications for us as human beings from your perspective when, when, you, when, 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 when we look at this theory? I think the implications couldn't be more, more significant. Um, for one, it has a direct bearing on what we consider um, the meaning and purpose of life. Um, if we are living in a society that has adopted, as it has, a metaphysical physicalism or metaphysical materialism would be the more popular name, uh, as its main narrative, uh, then you believe that all that exists is matter. The only thing okay. that will endure is matter and that our consciousness is a kind of side effect or technically an epiphenomenon of uh, ephemeral arrangements of matter that eventually will fall apart and our consciousness will fall apart with it and disappear, then the only conceivable purpose of life, the only endurable thing that you can think of is to collect and, and, and accumulate uh, matter <laughs> or mm -hmm. stuff or things and then that leads to consumerism. Uh, but if you, if you truly understand and internalize that this is a mental world, and that what we consider our personal consciousness in is indeed ephemeral, but it's not truly what we are, um, that mind itself endures, then yeah, the, you, you have to rethink um, and weigh again what you consider to be the meaning of your life. And of course, you know, the, the, the biggest meaning threat uh, in the West is, is death, because in the West it's considered uh, the end of everything that you can possibly care about. Even the thing that cares about it, it will end. Um, and um, that, that, that soothes our fears uh, because previous generations 200 years ago, their greatest fear was fear of the experiential unknown after death. Mm. So they didn't know where they are going to end up. I mean, they, they went up in hell. And that was the biggest fear of humanity in the West. We have soothed that over the last two, three hundred years because we think death is the end of experience. So it's the end of fears, the end of all of your problems. There will be nobody there to suffer. That's very soothing. But the price we pay for it is um, uh, a breaking meaning. Mm. We've lost contact with meaning. There is no meaning. There is no purpose, uh, which is probably more important than, than soothing our fears. So I think one of the implications of this view of the world is that uh, uh, meaning is back and so is fear. <laughs> yes. How interesting. That's, so meaning is back. I love that idea. Because, and you're, you're right. And I, I guess what we're seeing here, too, is the intersect of, of uh, you know, different belief sets if we think about Hinduism around the concept of reincarnation, this is where I guess that belief set is somewhat lining up with, 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 with this, this concept, this primacy of consciousness concept that we're talking about, the fact that we're going to continue on. Um, how do you feel about the, the, I guess, 
this, how do you feel about those two coming together? When I say consciousness will continue, I don't necessarily mean our personal consciousness, our personal identity. I think um, life, biology, is the appearance of a process of localization or dissociation in universal consciousness. And mm -hmm. by the same token, death would be the end of that dissociation. So your personal identity perhaps would even be remembered, but I don't think you would identify with that because it seems to correlate so tightly with the existence of the body, the body being, in my view, uh, the image of that dissociative process, that localization process. Mm -hmm. So I think um, when Bernardo Kastrup dies uh, I, uh, uh, as a body, I think Bernardo Kastrup as a narrative of personal identity will also be seeing through. I don't think Bernardo Kastrup will endure uh, in the form of an individual soul. Maybe he will, uh, but I don't see today very, very good reasons to, to, to believe that. I think right. a simpler, more credible alternative is that, yes, your consciousness will continue, but that consciousness is not Jan Ramsey. That mm. consciousness is, is what Schopenhauer described as uh, the, the eternal eye of the world, which looks out from every creature. Um, mm. at, at that level, you and me are the same thing. It's pure subjectivity. Mm. Um, so, uh, in so far as the idea of reincarnation presupposes the survival of uh, a personal self, the one I'm not person. sure it will align. Yeah. Right. Okay. So there's some similarities, but not completely lining up. But so what we're talking about here is this: this we're actually through this this concept of feeling that we're part of the bigger consciousness and that we're not going to die. It does, as you say, it delivers us a lot more meaning to our lives now. Is it also here this connection between if we're saying that you and I at this point moment we're in our physical state and we're individual whirlpools, if you like, in the bigger whirlpool having these images of this physical experience, do you then subscribe to this notion that um, that we are, in fact, if we, this is, the, I guess, the next leap forward in terms of our thinking as humanity is that we're no longer separate? I think that's the uh, that, that you and I are actually part of the one looking at each other having different physical experiences is is, is that fair to say that, yeah, yeah exactly I, I, I would go as far as to say that not only uh, this idea of individual separate identity is a an illusion you have to qualify what i mean by illusion what i mean it's not fundamental it's a a temporary configuration of consciousness that we identify with and get attached to um but I would go further and say that even the very notions of space and time uh, presuppose that dissociative process because space and time are categories of perception. And mm -hmm. what is perception? Perception is a point of view from across a dissociative boundary. When, we, when you perceive the world out there, this out there means it's across your dissociative boundary because what is within your dissociative boundary you identify with. Those are your thoughts, your emotions, experiences that rise within you. But what you perceive seem to be out there, seem to be, seem to be separate from you. And I would say that those are also mental processes that present, present themselves as the physical world because you look at them from across a dissociative boundary. Um, uh, where, was, where was I going with this? Uh, can, can, can you help me go back to my... We were, we, were, we were talking about this notion of separation versus... Yes, yes. yes. So um, from that perspective, um, it is separation that is illusory in the sense of being ephemeral. It, it, it's a narrative of self-identity that's not grounded in any fundamental aspect of existence. Ultimately, I am you and you are me and we are the whole thing going on. There is only one thing going on. And, and of, of course, uh, one, that realization, if it's really internalized more than intellectually, it's life-changing. Um, and, and it has tremendous bearing on our sense of ethics or our mm -hmm. sense of morals. Uh, because we are no longer this fundamentally separate thing that will die and then will not care about what will happen to the, what will happen to the world 50 or 100 years from now and let the, the next generations deal with it because we are not going to be here. Well, guess what? From that perspective, what you truly are, you will always be here. And whatever is happening, you are doing this to yourself. So, yes, it's a very different way to look at the world if you truly internalize it. Yes, if you truly, yes, so that's the difference. If you truly internalize it at that level in, term, in terms of what you're saying, in terms of, yes, my, my means that my actions now are going to have an impact on you, but are going to have an impact on, on you know, 
the people who come after us, our children's children and, and on the world itself. So this in many ways implies it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a calling out, if you like, to really help us take better care of not only ourselves, but our planet, but of each other and, and our communities. So it's, it's this has got... Yeah, this needs to be more than intellectual. And uh, um, my message is intellectual because I think uh, we need our intellects to give ourselves permission to, uh, to internalize something. Without that intellectual permission, it just bounces off. You know, we have our intellectual barriers and ideas just bounce off as, oh, this is new age silliness. So, you know, yes. um, and then you don't give yourself an opportunity to really internalize it. Um, so my, my my job, the battle I fight is a sort of uh, ancillary, but I think it's important, but it's not the core of the thing. The core of the thing is internalizing it. That's the only thing that will change the world. Absolutely. And that's that, well, my, I've shared that view entirely. So that's why I'm so pleased to have you on this podcast today. And effectively, that's the, 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 the foundation, the underpinnings for this podcast in terms of us coming to understand the true nature of who we really are and to understand that we have this, we are part of the one or the, the bigger consciousness. And therefore, what does that mean, as you say, for how we live our everyday lives now and how we look after our community, ourselves primarily, how do we think and feel about ourselves? How do we look after our community? How do we interact with our community? And, and as we're recording this, the um, the the Black Lives Matter um you know, movement is is really strongly with us, given the, the the horrific circumstances around George Floyd's death. So, I think this is very topical at the moment in terms of us looking after ourselves as a, as a community, um, and also then as uh, the planet as a whole. So, I guess then, so before we talk about how you came to this, another question I'd have is, what do you think then? is the purpose of us, if we are part of the bigger consciousness, what's your view in terms of why are we having this individual physical experience? Okay, uh, th th this a requires question. a delicate answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think what I'm saying implies a purpose. Um, right. Yeah, now, I, I think there is one, but it is not an implication of what I'm saying. I, I don't want what I'm saying to be judged on the basis of whatever purpose, whether it has a purpose or not. Um, I think we have reason to believe that uh, the nature is unfolding the way it is, it is creating life and, you know, galaxies forming um, because it is nature's nature <laughs> to behave like this. So from that perspective, I'm very naturalistic. I don't necessarily think that universal consciousness is um, self-conscious. I don't necessarily think that. Actually, I don't think it premeditates, that it it plans things out and it has a deliberate purpose. I don't think that is the case. I think um, higher level mental functions like self-reflection, premeditation, planning, um, metacognition, as psychologists call it, I think these things have evolved in living beings because of the game of survival so these were tools that, that, that have evolved because of that's what nature does it it, it, it evolves uh, these things in the context of an ecosystem so i don't think the universal consciousness out there beyond our dissociative boundaries has a premeditated plan and it's playing a game in which we are the pawns on the board i, I don't think that's what's going on I think it's doing this because it, it, it is its instinctive nature to do this. Mm. Um, I think it's a play of instinct, experiential, but instinctive and, and not thought through. Um, that said, I think there can still be a implicit telos or an, an implicit purpose underlying the instinct. And I, I try to give you an intuition for that. Um, I don't think crocodile, you're in Australia, so I talk about crocodiles. Um, yes. <laughs> I don't think crocodiles um, have a thought through purpose. I don't think they have a plan or they have an idea about where their lives are going. I think they are purely instinctive and therefore predictable. I think that's why the laws of nature are so predictable. They are the appearance of instinctive behavior, which is predictable. Um, but a crocodile will know whether things are going well or not. It will know whether it's comfortable or not. It will know whether things are going downhill or uphill. Uh, it, it is an instinctive mechanism. It's not telling itself, oh, things are going well. No, but but it will experience that things are going well. 
Mm. And I think uh, at a universal level, that universal consciousness knows whether things are getting warmer or not. And uh, the way it gets warmer, I think, is the development of self-awareness. It's the, the moment when consciousness um, contemplates its own experiences and says, I am, ex I am experiencing that. Mm. that that's that moment of self-reflection in which awareness sort of raises its head out of this tsunami of instinctual unfolding and it contemplates what's happening and suddenly realizes its own nature um mm. i think this is what uh, universal consciousness registers as oh i'm getting warmer here and in that sense it it, it it's a purpose just like the crocodile knows whether where, whether things are going well or not and um, because I think when that happened for the first time, when the first self-aware being had the thought, I am experiencing, I think that had a, an, a, an earthquake impact on universal consciousness. And it, that has to do, I think, with uh, why life is so robust that mm -hmm. um, it, it has populated every corner of this planet. And, and although it's fragile in terms of diversity, it's extremely robust in terms of its existence. I mean, we are not running any risk of destroying life, life on this planet. The only risk we are running, and it's very serious, is of destroying ourselves. That's a very real risk. Uh, per perhaps a higher chance than 50-50 that we will succeed in destroying ourselves. But give it a million years, and this planet is full of life again. And that seems to be a very natural, strong impetus in nature. And I think it has to do with this idea of uh, achieving metacognition, self-awareness. Mm. Oh, it's fascinating. So, yes, you're right. It's this, so we, <clears throat> you're saying the, and I, I agree with you in terms of in a million years, the planet may look different, but it will still be here. It will still survive. And um, you're right. I think as a human race, we've, we've got some things to do to, to really look after ourselves and to to think about things in it and to look, look after ourselves as a race in a different way. But it's interesting, it's those horizons that we look at, thing, the, the, the length of time or the, the horizon out that we look to. So the earth itself, as you say, in a million years will be fine. Where humanity will be, that's ultimately, I guess, up to us in terms of this, this level of self-awareness and self-cognition that you're talking about. Look, um, our, our species is 200,000 years old, as far as mm -hmm. we know. You can understand. And, uh, yeah, and our ability to think think symbolically, which is a requirement for self-awareness, you have to create a symbol for yourself in your own consciousness and identify yourself yourself with that symbol, so you know, oh, I am that. Uh, that is even younger. That's perhaps mm. fifty thousand years old. Mm. So you know, <laughs> we are two two hundred thousand years old, and we are self-aware for about fifty thousand. This this is not even the blink of an eye uh, in the history of the universe. If we destroy ourselves. Now, given a million years, probably we'll be ahead in wh what we are today. So uh, we are very ephemeral. We are like mayflies. But um, what nature is building up upon is very robust. Yes, that's a fascinating view. I mean, my view is is that we are part of the consciousness. And, and if I guess from the physical perspective is that we're here to expand and we're here to experience ourselves. And I, and, and I guess from my perspective, too, to experience ourselves in a positive way, in a joyful way, rather than in a negative way. And I think this is almost the, the tipping point that we're coming to in our society in terms of how do we, we have had the last, you know, as you've mentioned earlier, the last 300 years of, of materialism, um, of there's definitely been a body of thought around that, this notion of us, of us being individuals. And I think potentially we're on this with your work and the work of other scientists around the world, we're starting to perhaps as a society, become open to this idea of being a a, a larger or, or or part of a larger consciousness which then can allow us to to look after to, to look at ourselves and our world in a different way um i've got so many questions for you but in terms of uh in terms of what led you to this work what what led you here you had an it degree you had an it a phd in it you'd worked at cern um you worked at the phillips research laboratories what in what led you to this work and what, what led you to this work i think i had um, from birth i had an inclination for you know asking myself what what is the nature of this oh what's going on what is this all about uh, but yeah you're a kid you're having fun you don't think much about that um, my father died very early and that's the first time you get shaken and go like oh mm -hmm. hey wait a moment this is not all about fun i was 12 mm -hmm. years old 
And then you start asking the deeper questions. And what, what is life? What is, what is a human being? I mean, mm -hmm. how does it fit in, in this whole context? That sort of faded away during university times. I went to university, I was 17. So when I just completed 22, I was out. And then these questions returned. And then in my work as a, as a computer engineer, I was working with AI. And although artificial intelligence has nothing to do with artificial consciousness, you can build an intelligent computer that is not conscious at all. Um, um, of course, when you're working on that, you're asking yourself, well, if, if I know how to make it intelligent, what is missing to make it conscious? And I and sort of wrestled with that question for a few years until I realized that, hey, uh, I have to examine my assumptions. Um, one of my key unexamined assumptions was that consciousness is something you can create. You can put matter, you can arrange matter in a certain way and magically, poof, it, it becomes conscious. Um, yeah, and, and I realized I have no, absolutely no reason uh, to think that if you really, you know, study those assumptions in depth, uh, you realize that that's a kind of programming, it's a cultural autopilot that we sort of inherit and then we go along with, with, with that without thinking deeper about it. And so that trigger forced me to think deeper about it. And I eventually I came to the conclusion that you don't create consciousness be because consciousness is that within which everything gets created. So I sort mm. of, I was inverting foreground and background. And yes. uh, once that realization pops, it's like pulling on the thread of something. You know, one thing brings in another and you keep on pulling on that thread. And eventually you, you understand what matter is. You understand that matter is just the extrinsic appearance of conscious inner life from across a dissociative boundary. I mean, the matter of my brain and its activity is what my conscious inner life looks like to you or to a neuroscientist examining my functional MRI or brain scan of my brain. Uh, it's not the cause of my conscious inner life. It's what my conscious inner life looks like from across my dissociative boundary. And my dissociative boundary looks like the skin of my body, my eyes, my sense organs. Um, and then you, re you, you bring that to the rest of the universe. I would say the inanimate universe as a whole, all inanimate matter, that as a whole, it's also the extrinsic appearance or the image of uh, uh, universal conscious inner life uh, dissociated from us. I would say that's what matter is. It's what conscious inner life looks like from a certain perspective. So there is no way I'm going to make a computer conscious by putting matter together because I'm already operating with the boundary of something that, uh, that, that it's not conscious. Conscious, it is in consciousness or it is consciousness. It's not separate from consciousness and acquires consciousness in some way. It is consciousness itself, and everything that we are doing happens within it. It's it's a huge concept, and how what a fantastic leap that you made. But what a fascinating manner for you to step into that, because literally you were working with AI, and you came to this point of of well, where do we where does the consciousness sit? So, if I can perhaps uh, paraphrase what I think I've just heard you say is that. Another analogy would be it's almost like we're inside this ocean of consciousness, and if we could breathe under the under the ocean, then that would obviously be be uh, useful. But just imagine for a minute that we can. But it's almost like we're individuals inside the greater ocean, and we can't necessarily create something that is already there. So <laughs> you can't put something into something that is already there. So yeah. that's okay. So that. That makes sense. Okay, good. Yes, but um, I, but to, uh, some people might conclude that uh, this means that a mobile phone is conscious. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that the mobile phone is conscious in the sense of having its own private conscious in their life. What I'm saying is rather that the mobile phone is in consciousness. It exists as a construct within consciousness. Mm -hmm. That does not entail or imply that it is conscious in and of itself. Because I think uh, private conscious in their life is, uh, um, is something that arises from a dissociative process. I have private conscious in their life. You does. You do. I don't think a mobile phone has. And why do I say that? Because I think life is the image of this dissociative process, of this whirlpool in universal consciousness. And a telephone is not alive. 
So I, I, I don't think it is the image of its own private conscious inner life. It doesn't metabolize, it's not biology. And insofar as we can gather empirically, it is life that has private conscious inner life um, or, or has private mentation or private experiences, not silicon computers. I think silicon computers are just part of the inanimate universe as a whole. Mm. And, and the inanimate universe as a whole has its own conscious inner life. If I can give you an analogy, I don't think a single neuron in my brain in and of itself has its own conscious inner life. I think that neuron is just part of an image of the conscious inner life of Bernardo. There is something it is like to be Bernardo as a whole, but there isn't something it is like to be a single neuron in Bernardo's head. Actually, there isn't even such a thing as a single neuron in Bernardo's head. It's not a separate entity. It's just part of an image, a group of pixels that we separate out for, for linguistic convenience so we can refer to it. But that separation is only nominal. It's linguistic. There is no such a thing as a separate neuron. There is only one integral image composed of pixels. Uh, and, 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 and that thing is my private associated inner life that projects this image. In the same way, I think there is nothing it's like to be a mobile phone or a silicon computer. They are just nominally separated segments of a much bigger image, which we call the inanimate physical universe. And I think there is something it is like to be the inanimate physical universe as a whole. Mm. Okay, I, that, and that's a great, um, you've, made, you've made a great delineation there because, and, and the, 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 the delineation you're making is this, the difference between ourselves and the inanimate is this, this notion of life, the fact that I have, you and I can breathe, you're right, we're metabolising, we've got a biology just like plants, so living objects versus inanimate objects. So based on that delineation we've just been talking about, you also talked about the the image of the neurons in the brain and, and something that I've heard you um, speak about in other um, in other uh, uh, interviews that I've heard you you do, I think it was Deepak, the Sages and Scientists presentation you did um, for the Chopra Foundation in 2014. You talked about, um, and I really like this analogy of lightning being an image of atmospheric discharge rather than itself. Could you perhaps explain just yeah. share, share that with us a little bit, bit more? I think that would be useful. There are undeniable correlations between patterns of our brain activity and our inner experiences. Uh, that's undeniable. There is also an, an undeniable correlation between physical actions and inner experience. If you drink alcohol, your con inner consciousness will sort of be altered. Um, if somebody hits you in the head, something will happen with your conscious inner life. So these are uh, un undeniable things. It would be silly of anyone to say, oh, no, it's a coincidence or whatever. Um, but a correlation doesn't imply a causation. Uh, it's one of the most famous uh, fallacies in philosophy and mm. science. Um, I think we mistake the image of the process for the cause of the process. I think uh, brain activity is what my conscious inner life looks like from a certain perspective. It is the appearance of the process from a certain perspective. It's not its cause. And it correlates with my conscious inner life because the image of the process obviously correlates with the process. It's what the process looks like. So of course they will correlate. Um, but I don't think this correlation implies a cause. I think the, if you want to talk about cause, I think you have to invert the arrow of causation. It is my conscious inner life that causes this image. Um, and that causation is, is instantaneous. Uh, so it, it's very difficult to pin it down. When we get confused, mistaking uh, uh, image for cause, we also get confused mistaking description for the thing described, which is the, the basis of the materialist metaphysics, this materialist worldview, wherein we say that what really exists is mass, charge, momentum, spin, frequency, amplitude, the geometrical relationships, all these quantities, all these physical descriptors in, in numbers. Um, these are very handy and effective ways to describe perceptual experience. That's how mm. these numbers came about. That's how the equations of physics came about. Physics is a science of perception. Even if you use uh, instrumentation, equipment to enhance our perception, like telescopes and microscopes and scanners of every sort, uh, you still need to perceive the output of these tools uh, in order for them to have any effect, to have any meaning. So physics is a science of perception. And we've discovered that it's, it's 
very handy to imagine that there is something out there underlying those perceptions. It's very handy to imagine that in order to predict how perception will behave, which is the basis for technology. But then we get lost and we think that what really exists is the description, all these numbers, all these equations, and that what they describe, in other words, perception with its felt qualities, that, that is secondary. That is somehow created by our brains inside our, our skull. There is no world out there of colors and flavors. No, all these colors and flavors, according to mainstream materialism, are created inside your head, inside your skull. What is really out there is best described as an abstract set of equations, perhaps some silhouettes and forms, but also abstract, defined in geometrical, geometric terms. Um, so that's that's the other big error. We uh, we start from the thing that really exists, we describe it, and then we mistake the description for the thing that really exists, mm -hmm. and and we mistake the image of the process for the cause of the process. I think these are the two main confusions of the Western mind for the past three four hundred years since the seventeenth century, and at root they are one only thing manifesting itself in two different ways. Sorry, can you just repeat what you said? I, I think at root. Mm -hmm. These two mistakes, replacing uh, the reality described uh, with the description and mistaking uh, um, the image of a process for the cause of the process, I think at root, they are one and the same error, the same mistake, just manifesting itself in two different ways. Right. And uh, we don't laugh about it because we are immersed in it. We are in the historical juncture in which these mistakes somehow have become plausible within our cultural narrative. But I have very little doubt that uh, sometime from now, maybe not a long time from now, future generations will look back in, in, in tremendous surprise, almost with incredulity and say, my God, how lost these people were. And um, they may laugh at us, but I think they will laugh in, in, in a heartfelt way, almost with sympathy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for what's going on today, uh, because our the narrative by which we live our lives today is is outright ridiculous, but um, the, the consensus gentium makes this ridiculousness come across as plausible. That's it, and the, you've you've led us straight into the, I guess the the next question that I wanted to ask, which was, how has your work been received? Because your work is a jumping off point from, as you've said, this sort of the last 300 years of, of thought, um, mainstream, and my understanding of the term is mainstream materialist uh, scientific thought. And so how has your work been received, given that this is quite a departure and there would be a lot of people who are very invested in maintaining that school of thought? Well, in the beginning, I, I used to be associated very quickly with the new age and mysticism. Um, because I was talking about, you know, a spatially unbound consciousness, oh, universal consciousness, oh, cosmic consciousness, oh, uh, <laughs> mysticism, Rosicrucianism, and all this stuff, uh, which I don't poo-poo, by the way. I think there yeah. is something to that, but um, that's not the character of my message. I'm still, um, I'm, my position is very naturalistic. It's even very highly reductionist. Mm. You cannot be more reductionist than I am. It's just that I am reducing to something other than matter. I'm reducing yes. everything to consciousness, to the patterns of excitement and the topologies of consciousness, but ultimately there is only consciousness. So I'm an extreme reductionist and I'm a naturalist as well, because I think this consciousness unfolds according to predictable natural patterns, because it's instinctive in nature, except in us, because we have evolved metacognition. And uh, over the years, um, people have realized that, I mean, it's happening now, um, it's not widespread. A lot of people who never heard about my work and their first impression is, oh, then here goes another mystic. Um, I have nothing against mystics, by the way, uh, absolutely nothing against. But there is a certain prejudice as associated with the word that sort of gets transferred to my message before people really look into that. But this has been changing. And uh, I think there are several motivations for the change. One, there is widespread recognition now amongst the people who are actually working on it, that the metaphysical materialism or mainstream physicalism just doesn't work. It has uh, insurmountable problems. Um, neuroscientists, neuroscientists of consciousness, I think, 
the more honest you honest ones are coming to this conclusion neurologists i think are coming to this conclusion certainly philosophers 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 of mind many of them are are, are realizing that hey the, the assumptions of materialism just don't work because you know we replace a, we replace the world for a description and then guess what? We cannot reconstruct our experience from that description. Yeah, we will never do because the description doesn't exist in and of itself. Um, and this recognition is creating a new level of openness to alternatives that was not there even five years ago. I started out with this 10 years ago. And over the past few years, I noticed substantial changes. I mean, I, I, I have this in mind now because at the moment we are recording this, it's early in June. Um, we, I had just had a debate, for instance, with uh, um, uh, Peter Atkins, professor, uh, uh, professor Peter Atkins, famous atheist in the UK, and Susan Blackmore and a few others. Um, then I was surprised by what I perceived as a some level of openness to my message and and, and not a not a hostile attitude to me at all. I mean, I came to these debates prepared and armed to my teeth to defend my position and push back on them. And um, uh, their opening statement uh, already conceded that, oh, maybe this guy is right. I mean, before I said a word. Um, and, and of course, they will say, no, it's highly speculative. There are many other alternatives. But at least now, people who have a second look at what I'm saying, they realize, oh, this guy is not crazy. He is not nuts. Uh, 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 he is reasonable. You know, he is adhering to to our values like parsimony, internal consistency, empirical adequacy. You know, uh, all this stuff that uh, bases our scientific approach to the world. You know, I'm a reductionist. I'm a naturalist, and all that. So I think people are puzzled and curious about it now. But uh, the, the momentum of the cultural narrative is gigantic. So even if people rationally realize, hey, this actually may be a better alternative, people are so used to what things have been like that uh, that that switch will take an unavoidable amount of time to happen. It will not happen like this. It will not happen overnight. No, no, that's right. It's interesting you say that you've seen those. You've been working in this field for the last 10 years and you see a difference in the, even in the last five. And... Um, you know, I've come to this 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 field of thinking more recently, but certainly what I've been noticing is with the research that I've been doing is that there's more and more voices that are aligned, uh, scientific voices that are looking at, you know, the, the notion of, of the brain versus consciousness, and they're looking at at, at experiences of near death experiences and 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 you know really looking to bring together data around those experiences, and it's almost like many voices are starting to to line up around um around this this new idea i think what's interesting for you to say is that is that people are realizing that effectively the old constructs are not working that's effective they, they, they can't make those constructs work so and I, I i'm grateful that there's an openness then to your ideas how heartening that you went to that debate and instead of having to defend yourself there was an, an openness to those ideas um so that's showing us the progression but you're right there is very much then this this other mainstream narrative for people who I guess have invested their careers, their their life's work in 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 basically saying the, the, talking about the primacy of matter versus the primacy of consciousness. So this is where again our human nature to to stick to and hold true to a belief set um, comes through. So this view of the world isn't even new perhaps it's the oldest view of the world mm -hmm. and 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 it's not even new in the west because if you look back only 200 years ago back to 1818 um a, a western guy arthur schopenhauer mm -hmm. has came up ca has come up with precisely this view it's just that he used words that today we don't understand well these words have acquired a different meaning than the meaning he uh, implicitly attributed to them 200 years ago. So we think he was talking nonsense. I mean, he talked about uh, will and representation. Today, we would say transpersonal phenomenal consciousness and uh, the patterns on the screen of perception. I mean, we would speak about it in more technical terms. But uh, this intuition about what's really going on has, has always been there. It has never disappeared. It has arisen independently in the West itself, not only from the East, uh, multiple times. So, yeah, there's nothing new to this. We just need to reawaken to what we have already known for, for generations. 
generation that's right so it's about having conversations just like this really isn't it and opening up dialogue and sharing the sharing of ideas um so that we can come to because ultimately i think what you're saying your work is you are a reductionist but your work is about saying well if we can start looking at the world through a different lens we might be able to help ourselves help our planet work in it and we might be able to repair ourselves in a different way so i think that's one of the key messages that i'm, I'm taking away from you it's not about making others wrong or it's it's certainly none of none of that but it's but it's about a more inclusive view where we can see that perhaps we are you and i are each other we're no longer separate because i think this is the when i look at things from a from a you know a societal or a community perspective we look at the statistics around stress and depression and anxiety um, and general burnout there's a general dis particularly in the west you know there appears to be if you look at those statistics um that there's a general dissatisfaction with the way things are so the way we're living is is potentially not serving us or a lot of people are feeling uh well if you like dissatisfied by their current separate separate individual mode of, of living it is not surprising isn't it i mean we have excluded meaning from 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 our picture of nature uh, mm. this is unnatural uh, it doesn't resonate at all with our deeper nature with our deeper in, deepest intuitions so it, it is not a surprise i mean you are sick if you're living in a society that stimulates and does everything possible to make you sick um mm. it, it's not surprising now look I don't put forward the views I put forward because they bring meaning back to life. I am too married to truth uh, to play a game like that. Um, I think I put forward these views because I think they are true. And, uh, and if the truth were to be meaningless and so crushing, too bad, so be it. I would still go after the truth because i don't know why i'm i have this obsession i am I, I need to go after the truth there's nothing i can do about it i'm interested in the truth not in a soothing message but having concluded that for very good objective reasons for logical reasons for experimental reasons uh, empirical reasons coming out of physics coming out of neuroscience for all these objective reasons that that is the best picture of truth we can construct today having arrived at it and then realizing hey by the way this can also restore meaning now now i am very interested in putting this message out because i think our suffering is to a large extent unnecessary and uh, there is nothing more crushing than to suffer for no reason to suffer that's because you're telling yourself a narrative that is untrue mm -hmm. um, but that's not the reason why i think what i'm saying is true <laughs> I, I appreciate and I appreciate again your your clarity around that and it's it's this integrity in your work and your focus on the truth that is it, it's very refreshing and what it does though is that yes if you're almost saying well the meaning making the meaning of life is almost a side benefit of what you're doing but in terms of the work that you're doing it is it's unclouded and you're focused on, on on attaining clarity or truth from from your perspective, and and I think that's 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 fantastic. I, others work with that as they I, so choose. I'm not emotionally disconnected from this, and because you see, once you convince yourself that okay, this is the closest we can get to truth based on what we know today. It may not be the final truth, but based on all we know, this is the best we can make. And then you realize that people are suffering because they are holding to a demonstrably false notion of truth. That's heart wrenching. It's heart wrenching to watch the news for me. So That's guess what I do? I haven't watched the news on television for the past ten years, more or less. Uh, mm. What I do to keep myself informed is I have a look at the headlines, and uh, and I, I defend myself emotionally. And it may be cynical, I don't know, but uh, I am at a place where I'm sensitive to this because it just makes it makes me feel almost desperate sometimes that all of this is because of a very very bad fairy tale we are telling ourselves believing in and living according to and it's that there is no reason for that to be happening no reason grounded in reality in truth for this to be happening yeah i i i can't stand it sometimes well thank you look i i'm i'm with you i agree i i don't consume the news the way I used to um, for exactly the same reason. It's too difficult and it's too 
impact it, it too negatively impactful on your emotions in terms of then to be able to do the work or to live the way you want to live so i do get that and it's heart-wrenching and i guess that's why i wanted to have this conversation with you today to help people particularly people who may feel a bit skeptical who may come to this these concepts from other perspectives to hear a philosopher with a scientific background such as yourself to say that there is a truth here that's not that is that is something that is that is able to be grasped onto that doesn't have a lot of other mythology around it and i think that's what you're saying here is there's there's a there's a fundamental truth here in terms of us being part of a larger consciousness i mean there's many more questions i'd like to ask you and we may have to talk again at one point in the future but um because there are many more things i'd like to talk about but i guess in summary what we're saying here is that there is this fundamental truth that you're saying to us is is able that we are now able to grasp onto that can give us a sense of meaning and I, if i may just make a quick observation jen uh, i i don't think we as human beings are capable of discerning the final fundamental truth we are primates evolved on a peripheral planet of a peripheral galaxy um but i think on the basis of everything everything we do know right now we can be sure that the current mainstream narrative is wrong there are mm -hmm. many lines of reasoning to refute the current mainstream narrative and there are very good reasons to adopt a better narrative on the basis of all we know now is that the final truth i doubt but it's the best we can come up with today yes perfect and i think that's that's great so it's this and I, I'm with you. I think every, the, the truth is really the truth from within us for each individual person. But I, I think what we're talking about here is that there's another narrative that we as a society can start to move towards that's going to be more supportive for us in our internal experience um, to help us reduce that suffering that you spoke about, but also can potentially then be used to assist with our external experience in terms of how we relate to each other in our communities, how we relate to our planet. And... Um, potentially then how we also relate to, to the wider universe. Because you're right, we're on the edge of the edge here. There are probably many other uh, beings out there that, that potentially we can interact with. Um, just briefly before we finish, what do, where do you see this field going in the future and what are your next steps in, this, in your work? How are you progressing this work? I, I don't have a master plan. Uh, I go with the flow. I do the best I can every day uh, in the now. Um, I don't know how things will turn out. I do feel encouraged. I think over the last couple of years, there has been a palpable change in the cultural ethos in terms of receptiveness for a alternative narrative, because the current one is, it, it is so bad in so many different ways that not even the momentum of four, three, 400 years can keep it alive. So I'm, I'm very hopeful. I will continue to do what I can. If it's enough, great. If it's not, then I did what I could and I, and I am in peace with that. Um, I, I don't try to take on the responsibility of changing the world. I can't. It would be uh, a delusionary uh, hero complex to do that. So I do my part the best I can and the rest is not up to me. Mm. Beautiful, I th and I agree with you. We all, if we can just do the best we can in our in our space, and with with the talents we've been given, and you've certainly been given a vast array of talents and, a, and incredible experiences to to bring you know to bring this work to bear. Um, just finally, this podcast is called Your Freedom Unlimited. What does given all of that conversation we've just had, what does freedom mean to you? Freedom is the willingness to do what a deeper part of you knows must be done. Mm. Yeah. I, I don't think the ego has much in the way of freedom. No, I it agree. It constructs a narrative of freedom. True mm. freedom is to not interfere what has to happen through you, mm. what has to come into the world through you. If you don't interfere with that and you let it happen, that's true freedom. Fantastic. I'd have to say I'm very aligned with with you on that as well. So, Bernard, I'd just like to say thank you very much again for your time today. I know it's late in the evening for you. Um, you've been very generous with your time with us today. Um, where can people find more information about you? I know you have a, a fantastic website. Should we? Is that the best place for people to go to learn more about your work? 
it's where everything is linked from so if you go to my website there are links to everything videos academic papers books uh, popular essays uh, podcasts the the whole shebang is in there it's uh, bernardo castrup one word dot com castrup with a k that's fantastic well bernardo thank you so much for your time today you've really helped shed a lot of light on this debate and coming for as you said from your reductionist naturalist perspective um, you've given us a lot to to really contemplate. But as you've said, you have shown us a truth and a new narrative that is in alignment with, as you said, thinkers from you know many hundreds of years ago, and I think some would say the ancients in terms of their view of the world. So we are in this process of, of bringing together different thoughts and different ways of being on your Freedom Unlimited. So I really appreciate your time and for sharing your, your knowledge so generously with us. And um, thanks I'll for having me. Again soon. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you.